I've been given 15 minutes to talk about uh, media disruption and how it affects storytelling. This is something I've been thinking about probably every day for the last 15 years. So 15 minutes, that seems about right. Um, see, it didn't seem like it was right, no? Yeah, anyway, I, I'm gonna set the bar very high for myself, high expectations for this presentation. I want this presentation to be 25% as entertaining as Sarah Palin's uh, endorsement of Donald Trump, and twice as unintelligible. Yeah. That guy there, he who does with the enemy bend over, thank you, enemy. Anyway, before I get started, um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to show a quick video to kind of set the parameters uh, of my talk a little bit. You know, because we are part of the digital wild west here at the HuffPost, but we still have standards and we care a lot about how we present ourselves as a brand. So what I want to do is I want to show you a video that uh, we did compiled from what we do and what we allow and what we don't allow uh, on, on our show HuffPost Live. So if you could show that, that might be useful. Can you swear on this show? You're not allowed to swear on this. Uh, hey, you can't curse. Can that be on? I don't know what we can say on this show. I don't know, can I say it here? I don't know what Oh yeah, we, we, we go all the way with it. With the internet. Swear all you want. You can say asshole too. Yeah. Oh, I like it. Okay, in that case, he's kind of a cunt face. <laughs> what? <laughs> motherfucker. Lucky fuck uh, rocker. Taliban motherfucker. She just said motherfucker. Motherfucker. I am your father, motherfucker. Motherfucker. This is good. It works. I like this. Fucking down. Fuck you. Fuck you, man. Fuck off. No, nah, fuck you. Face fuck up. Fucking too loud. Fuck it. Fuck you. Face fucking. I'll rip your fucking face off. Got me fucked up, man. Tell him to go fuck himself. You shut the fuck up. <laughs> and fuck you. You didn't curse once. Damn it. I could have. Fuck. So that's basically, you know, I've got to work within those parameters. This is actually kind of a propitious moment for me, if I may be personal for a moment. This is my last official act as the founding editor of the Huffington Post. I'm going to be taking a one-year sabbatical from anything that's not fun. So this is fun, though. But so this is my last official moment. So this decision on my part has given me kind of a nostalgic uh, moment, you might think a reverie as I think back, and it really has put me to thinking how disruptive the last 11 years have been. When we launched HuffPost in 2005, uh, there was no Facebook, there was no Twitter, there was no Instagram, there was no Snapchat, let alone uh, the last thing that's been invented in the two minutes that I've been talking to you already. So, no YouTube. Uh, YouTube was three months old, actually. It launched in February 2005. And these are the things that we deal with every single day at HuffPost. They're central to what we do. And I think that that's really what we've been most successful at, and I think what the lesson for all of us is, is how can you change, how can you adapt, how can you take on these incredible innovations and disruption and yet stay true to your core, to your DNA? And I think that is the most important thing for all of us as we try to figure out how do we move forward with these multiplicity of platforms, the multiplicity of lengths, all this kind of stuff. At HuffPost, uh, what we've always thought is putting flesh and blood onto statistics, putting a human face on data. That is like our core mission as storytellers and as journalists. And if you think about it, this is probably the single greatest moment in the history of the world for data, right? A data-rich moment. You could find out pretty much any piece of data you want in a click, right? What's the average rainfall in Mozambique? Click, 34.5 inches, Roy. It's right there. We're not lacking in data. We have data coming out of our ears in other selected orifices. But what we don't have, I think, is storytelling, is narrative. I think there's a dearth of good storytelling. Uh, and for me, that's everything. For instance, if I was to say to you or you to say to me that we have 14.5% of the people in America living in poverty, my brain says, I know that's bad, but I'm not engaged. It doesn't pull me in. Even if you told me that that means that 45 million people are living in poverty. Again, my brain says, bad. I know it's bad, but I'm not engaged. 
But if you said to me, let me introduce you to John and Mary, they've been unemployed for over 18 months. Because of this, they had to move out of the house that they loved. Their kids had to leave the school that meant everything to them. They're now living in a car. I don't know about you, but I'm in. I want to hear more. And that's what I think narrative and storytelling can do. It can pull us in. It needs to be personal. It needs to be intimate. The good news for us storytellers is that technology, as Hussein touched on it, is changing in a way that it can make it easier and easier for us to tell that kind of story. You know, back in the 60s, Marshall McLuhan famously said, the medium is the message. Well, now I think the same thing applies to the platform is the message and the aesthetic is the message, right? On HuffPost Live, we very often use Google Hangouts or Skype to bring in people from all around the world. And when we first started doing it, you know, the, it doesn't look the greatest. Sometimes it's a little jumpy, sometimes it's a little scratchy, sometimes it actually freezes. And people are like, you know, that's not very professional. But for me, I think it actually felt more authentic. It felt real because that's, I don't know about you, but that's how I communicate, you know, with my parents. That's how I communicate with my kids who are away at school. You know, I, I, I FaceTime them. I use Google Hangouts. So when I see an expert or somebody coming in from someplace in the world talking that way, it feels authentic. And as Morgan said, authenticity is kind of at the key to all of this, you know? And I think this is true, as, as Hussein said as well, VR and 360. This, I think, is an amazing tool uh, for us storytellers. Uh, we've started experimenting it, just dabbing our, our toe into the water with our first VR series, which was called The Crossing, which we did in partnership with Susan Sarandon and the guys over at Riot. And what it did was we followed um, Syrian refugees arriving in Greece. Uh, let's take a quick look at that. Leg on their journey to freedom, packing these rickety boats from Turkey and arriving here on the Greek well, island. Drownings at sea has mounted recently as weather in the Aegean has taken a turn for the worse. 16 people in A boat just landed and uh, the divers got in there and helped right away to steer it in. Thousands and thousands of people with such huge needs and all of these incredible volunteers. I think this is a moment in history that's uh, moral and that we have to stop thinking of people as concepts. Hi, baby. This is hi, baby. Thank you. We are very, very happy. Why are you happy? Um, safe. They are very safe. Watching VR in a non-VR experience kind of sucks. So you're not getting the full uh, feeling of that. But trust me, it's very immersive. It takes you off of your couch as a viewer and puts you right there in the middle of the action. And you can't help but connect with these people and their stories. Um, and then we used adjunct content. We had 360 video diaries uh, that Susan Sarandon did. We did eight of those. And then we had her do nine blog posts. And obviously, we used all the platforms out there. We posted uh, little clips on Instagram, and we put it on Facebook, and we tweeted it. And this allowed everybody to learn what we were doing and come and get, get, get the full experience. Uh, we also translated it into multiple languages. We're now in 15 countries in the Huffington Post. So this was how we were able to reach uh, a massive global audience of our, our 120 million users. And we're making a big bet on the future on VR and 360 uh, because I think it really, it just enables that, that, that connection. Um, in the time I have left, I want to talk about a couple more things. One is the age-old question, does size matter? Yes, I am talking about the length of our videos. We live in this time where a 30-second video is thought of as a standard length, where a minute and a half is the equivalent of roots, for God's sakes. You know? And yet, it's the same period where people are binge-watching all 10 hours of the making of a murderer. Right? So we, have, we, we run this spectrum. Did you guys watch that, by the way? I got sucked in. It's the first uh, series that I've ever binge-watched. 
and I did admit that I walked around for the next three days going, I don't know. <laughs> Why did you tell that man that thing? I don't know. Did you kill that girl? No. Anyway, so length, how do you square the circle of that? The way we're squaring the circle of that is we're trying to make content that can play both as a snackable item and as a long-form, deep-dive, immersive experience. Uh, for instance, on HuffPost Live, recently one of our top things was we had an interview with R. Kelly. And uh, we asked him the questions that many people have not asked him. He didn't like it. He walked off the set. Uh, we took the highlights of that, uh, the, you know, a two and a half minute, three minute thing, got 10, 12 million views on it. But we also had hundreds of thousands of people watch the whole 18 minute interview. We're also doing a new series that just launched called New Hampshire, in which we follow around a group of millennials who are deeply involved in the primary that's coming up. Same thing. We have crews there, and every day they're sending us short form, quick turnaround, breaking news while we're in the process of creating a multi-part series. So I think that's obviously a, a challenge for us as, as storytellers and, and how I think we're trying to approach it. And I think the key is trying to create that content that both, as I said, goes deep, but is also very shareable. Uh, on that note, I want to say a quick thing about the impact that social is having on the content. We at Huffington Post have found that the rise of social has actually changed not just where people are watching it, but actually the kind of content that we're making. Not that we didn't care before, but we're actually seeing a rise in the quality of what we do. Right, search is a quantity game, right? You want to have an example for anything anybody searches for. You want your story to be first or second, and that's how the Huffington Post grew so rapidly. It's a one-click experience. Right? Once you search and you click on it, we've created the business uh, exchange there. I'm not saying that we don't care about you liking it, but that was the one exchange. But social is a two-click experience, right? You've got, I gotta get you to click on it, then you've gotta like it enough to wanna share it. And you don't wanna share anything that's crappy, because then your friends say, stop sharing the crappy stuff. You know? It's also interesting in the kind of things that we make, right? The things that we search for are not the same things that we share. If you look, obviously, at the numbers or what people are searching for, oh, I don't know, Miley Cyrus nude, perhaps? Uh, Vanessa Hudgens nude? Oh, he's, uh, somebody nude is always in the top there. You never would share that. Uh, you know, we're, we're trying to sort of put our idealized self out when we share. You know, these are the things I care about. I, I care about politics. I care about refugees. You know, Not that pornography and, and uh, 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 titillating material is going to go away, but it's, it's really changed, and it's not really a part of what people share. Uh, the way I always look at it to me is like sort of search. We search with our id, and we share with our superego. So that's kind of how uh, we've sort of seen that, and we've seen sort of the rise of that less quantity, higher quality. So to end here, I would just sort of say that for me, the most important thing is having a voice and not being afraid to have attitude and point of view. People don't want the view from nowhere anymore, right? They want to know what you think, where you stand, what's your take on an issue. Not just political issue, but, but any issue. So it's, it's having a take. And then the other thing is, as Morgan said, authenticity. You know, people want to, especially online, it's so personal. I mean, TV, you know, we're watching the big screen, that's great. Your phone, you, you have it in bed with you, right? It's right there. You're connecting it in a very intimate way. So authenticity to me is, is the key. I don't know who said it. Uh, it's been attributed to everybody from George Burns to Carol Burnett to Lenny Bruce. And they said that the key to success, whether it's in show business or politics, is having authenticity, and that if you can fake that, you've got it made. <laughs> anyway, uh, this is an unbelievable time to be working in this space. Uh, so much is happening. So many things are, I don't know, every night you go to sleep and then you wake up going, what mind-blowing thing has happened overnight that's going to change everything that we do? And in some ways, it gives one angst, but in other ways, it provides this incredible opportunity. And it's the reason uh, I think that we get up in the morning excited about doing what we do, or at least I will be uh, a year from now. <laughs>